Welcome to the first in a series of tutorials on bioenergetics, which is all about energy in living systems. It's about how energy enters living systems from the surroundings, uh, mostly as light by photosynthesis, how this light energy is then stored in chemical forms such as glucose, and then how this energy stored in such molecules is released and made available to the cell through the reactions of respiration. So in this first tutorial, I'd just like to introduce one or two of the molecules that act as energy sources in the cell. That is to say, um, molecules which act as fuel molecules, in much the same way that petrol and diesel act as fuel molecules in motor cars. Now, of course, car engines are designed to run on either petrol or diesel, and um, causes problems if you accidentally put petrol in a diesel car or the other way around. Cells can use different fuels even at the same time. Uh, the main fuels used in cells, of course, are carbohydrates and fats. And here I have drawn the structure of glucose, which is the most important carbohydrate fuel molecule in this respect. Now, glucose is a, a simple sugar, a monosaccharide, in that it consists of one sugar unit. And in fact, it's the main sugar in the blood where its concentration is about 5 times 10 to the minus 3 moles per decimeter cubed. Now, if you're not doing chemistry, you can think of that as just 9 milligrams of glucose in every cubic centimeter of the blood. Now, cells uh, around the body, such as muscle cells and liver cells, they can take this glucose directly from the blood and use it as an immediate source of energy, or they can convert it to glycogen, which is a storage form of polysaccharide, and use it later. I'd just like to reassure you that in these tutorials I will be showing some rather chem complicated chemical structures and you, you will not be expected to memorize the details of these structures. Um, I'm doing this because I think it will help you understand the points that I'm making. And similarly, I'll be doing some calculations and quoting quite a few numbers, such as um, energy values. But again, you're not expected to memorize these. Um, I'm using them purely to explain the concepts, to get over a, a feeling for what's going on in these reactions. Because when you're learning about bioenergetics at a level, uh, respiration and photosynthesis, uh, there is a risk that you will become so focused, obsessed with the minute details, the details of glycolysis, oxidative phosphorylation, light-dependent reactions, Krebs cycle, etc., that you'll miss the big picture, that you will not see the forest for the trees. What I'm trying to do is to give you a, a feeling, an overview of how all of these processes work together to form one large coherent energy cycle through which energy is transferred in biological systems from one form to another, between cells and indeed between organisms or organisms and their environment. Now glucose then, which I've drawn here, is the, at the centre of all these processes. It's the most important um, carbohydrate fuel molecule. And um, when a cell needs to extract energy from glucose, what it does is reacts it with oxygen. So I'm just going to write this as an equation. So C6H12 O6, the glucose reacts with oxygen, and what's happening in this process is that the carbon atoms, they combine with oxygen to make carbon dioxide, CO2, and because there are six carbons in each glucose molecule, that's enough to make six carbon dioxides, the hydrogen atoms combine with oxygen to give water molecules, H2O, and 12 hydrogens in one glucose is enough to make six H2O molecules. Now, you need altogether 18 atoms of oxygen to make six CO2s and six waters, but remember that there are already six oxygens available within the glucose molecule itself, so the other 12 that we need come from the uh, oxygen. This will be the oxygen that we breathe in by our lungs. Now, um, overall, this reaction is um, the same as combustion. So if I was to burn some glucose in oxygen to give CO2 and um, 
water, I would release a large amount of energy. And in much the same way that if I was to burn petrol or diesel in a car engine, I'm getting energy out. Respiration then, it's, overall it's the same process, but it occurs in lots of small steps rather than one big step. And each of these steps is controlled by an enzyme, and that allows the cell to regulate the process very carefully in highly controlled conditions. Now, I've been doing some um, calculations, and if a cell places, puts one molecule of glucose through the reactions of respiration, then it releases 4.7 times 10 to the minus 18 joules of energy. Okay, that's just from a single glucose molecule. You could say that is 4.7 times 10 to the minus 21 kilojoules of energy. Okay, so a kilojoule is just a thousand joules. Again, I'd just like to emphasize that you're not expected to remember these figures. For comparison, I want us to consider the amount of energy available from one egg. If you eat one egg, 335 kilojoules of energy are made available to your body. In the same way that if you eat one molecule of glucose, 4.7 times 10 to the minus 21 kilojoules of energy are made available to your body. Now, whereas 335 rolls nicely off the tongue, 4.7 times 10 to the minus 21 is rather an inconvenient number, quite cumbersome. So what we can do, instead of saying how much energy is released from one molecule of glucose, we can talk about multiples, lots of molecules of glucose. So by comparison with the egg, it's like saying how much energy is available from the um, from 12 eggs. So if I multiplied 335 by 12, I would get 4,020 kilojoules from uh, 12 eggs. In other words, from one dozen eggs. And that's very similar to what we do in chemistry or biochemistry. We multiply up, but instead of multiplying by 12, which wouldn't make much difference to this number, we multiply by 6 times 10 to the 23. And that, of course, is called a mole. So 6 times 10 to the 23 of anything is a mole, just like 12 of anything is called a dozen. So if you had a mole of eggs, you would have 6 times 10 to the 23 eggs. And so if I multiply 4.7 times 10 to the minus 21, by 6 times 10 to the 23, then what I get is um, 2,823 kilojoules of energy from one mole of glucose, which is a much more manageable number. Um, just so that you know what it looks like, this is um, a mole of glucose. In fact, it's 180 grams of glucose. Okay. Now, at this point, in the interests of correctness, scientific correctness, I would just like to point out that this value is not, in fact, the enthalpy change of the reaction. It's not the delta H. It is the change in Gibbs free energy. Now, if you're doing A-level chemistry, you will learn all about uh, Gibbs free energy. But if not, you don't need to be concerned about this. All it means is that if uh, a mole of glucose molecules is put through the reactions of respiration, 2,823 kilojoules of energy is made available to the cell. Now, because energy is being released in this reaction, we put a minus sign in front of it to say that energy is coming out of the chemical reaction and going to the surroundings. The other thing is that um, when we give the symbol for this energy change, so I will put it as Gibbs free energy, but as I say, if you're, if you're not doing chemistry, you don't need to worry about this. It's just an amount of energy that you get from 6 times 10 to 23 of these. And again, just to make this absolutely correct, um, we modify the standard state symbol with a little prime to say it's not actually under standard conditions, it's under biological conditions. So that affects the amount of energy that comes out available to the cell. But again, no need to worry about that if you're not doing A-level chemistry.
Now, it may not seem as though we get much energy released from um, one glucose molecule, or indeed a mole of glucose molecules. But in fact, this is a huge amount of energy to the cell. It's um, rather like going to the um, shops with uh, a £50 note to buy a newspaper or a pint of milk. Um, a glucose molecule is, is like that. It's a very large, inconvenient amount of energy. What the cell really needs is some loose change, some smaller molecules if you like, molecules that contain less energy, just like you would go to the shops with, a, with, with loose change in your pockets. And the most important molecule in this respect is ATP. Here then is a molecule of ATP. Now it's often described as being a universal energy currency in that it uh, uses an energy supply in, in all cells. I like to think of it as, the, uh, as a small change because um, ATP releases a, a small amount of energy compared with, for example, a, a glucose molecule. So it's much more convenient for the cell to get its energy from ATP. There are other reasons why ATP is useful, which I will explain very shortly. Um, I will explain how energy is released from ATP. But first of all, I'd just like to uh, say a few things about the structure. Now, this is a very simplified structure. You can see that we have adenine, which is one of the DNA bases, a nitrogenous base. It's uh, attached to a sugar. The sugar is ribose. And then we have three phosphate groups attached. Now, strictly speaking, we should say they are phosphoryl groups, um, but you hear them described as phosphate groups or inorganic phosphates. Now, that structure, you do need to be aware of that structure. You need to learn that for the exams. What you don't need to know are the detailed chemical structures of the individual parts of it. Um, but I'm going to show you that because it will help me explain the, the, some of the points um, that I would like to make. First of all, on this detailed structure of ATP, you can see that um, the base adenine consists of or contains nitrogen atoms. That's why these bases are called nitrogenous bases, as you find in DNA. It's exactly the same as the adenine that you find in DNA. The sugar ribose. Um, it's slightly different to the one in DNA. In DNA, you don't have this oxygen. So in DNA, it's 2-deoxyribose, 2 because it's on the second carbon atom. So that's why DNA is deoxyribose, nucleic acid. So in ATP, we have the, the ribose with the oxygen. And then we have the three phosphates. Now, if you have a DNA base attached to only a sugar, so if I cover up the phosphates, then that is called a nucleoside. Let's write that down. A nucleoside. Now because the base here is adenine, we can call it adenosine. Okay? Now, if you then attach phosphate groups onto a nucleoside, you make a nucleotide. So here we have, of course, a nucleotide. So, nucleotide. Now, in writing it like that, I'm not specifying how many phosphate groups I have got attached to the nucleoside. Um, here I've got three, but I could have just one and it would still be a nucleotide. So another way of naming this molecule is to say it is a nucleoside with phosphates on. So it's a nucleoside phosphate. So nucleoside phosphate. And then I can specify the number of phosphates and I can call it a nucleoside triphosphate, which in this case the nucleoside is adenosine, so it would be adenosine triphosphate. And that's where the name ATP comes from. Adenosine triphosphate, a nucleoside that's got three phosphates added on. Now, you often hear about 
these chemical bonds being high energy bonds, it's not really um, the correct way to describe them. Um, I will shortly explain how energy is released from the ATP molecule, but um, let's first of all consider these chemical bonds. This bond here and this bond here, they are called phospho anhydride bonds. Whereas this bond between the phosphates and the um, sugar is called a phosphoester bond. Now I'm not going to go any further than that because that's probably more than what you need to know anyway. These are phosphoanhydride bonds in the fact that um, each phosphate group has come together with the loss of a water molecule, whereas here it's more of an esterification reaction. So if you're doing A-level chemistry, that will be meaningful to you. This is very similar to how you form ethanoic anhydride when you remove a water molecule from two ethanoic acids, but here it's uh, a phosphate group rather than a carboxylic acid. Now this is just a little extra for those of you doing A-level chemistry. Um, we can show how a, a phosphoanhydride linkage or bond is formed between the uh, phosphate groups on ATP just using two molecules of phosphoric acid H3PO4. So an anhydride, it just means it's lost H2O molecule. So we take out a H2O molecule, there it is, and um, we have a phosphoanhydride linkage between the two phosphates. Now, that's very similar to the reaction that you should know about in A-level chemistry, which is if you do this reaction with two molecules of ethanoic acid, you will make ethanoic anhydride. So if I turn this into an ethanoic acid, CH3 there, another one here, then quite simply we get ethanoic anhydride which I'm sure you all know about is useful for esterification reactions. Again this is really just a little extra for those of you who are doing A-level chemistry um, it's to show how a, a phosphoester bond is formed between the ribose, of which I've got a partial structure here, and the first of the three phosphates. And again, we lose a, a water molecule, so that comes off over here. But this time, it's the reaction between an alcohol and an acid, but it happens to be phosphoric acid rather than the carboxylic acids that you'll be familiar with. So that's why it's called a phosphoester. So that's the phosphoester linkage. To summarize so far then, we have seen that if you send glucose through the series of reactions we call respiration, then you release 2,823 kilojoules of energy. Now that figure is for a mole of glucose molecules, in other words, 6 times 10 to the 23 of them. Now if you're not doing chemistry, it may be easier to think of that in terms of the energy released from a single molecule of glucose. So just one molecule of glucose releases 4.7 times 10 to the minus 21 kilojoules of energy. Now that may not sound like much energy, but to the cell it is a huge amount of um, energy. It's rather like giving the cell a £50 note and saying go and buy a newspaper or a pint of milk. So instead of um, using the energy directly from glucose, what, the, what happens in respiration is the energy that's released is used to make ATP. So ATP is like having lots of pan coins, the loose change, and each ATP molecule then releases a convenient amount of energy, the amount you might need to buy, well that wouldn't buy a newspaper these days would it, well not the ones that I read anyway. Right now, so each ATP molecule then 
each single molecule of ATP releases to the cell only 5.1 times 10 to the minus 23 kilojoules of energy. So you often see that in the textbooks as 30.5 kilojoules, but that's for a mole, okay? So let's just have a look at the um, conversion factors here. If we get from one molecule of glucose 4.7 times 10 to the minus 21 kilojoules from a molecule of glucose, and st stored in an ATP, we have 5.1 times 10 to the minus 23. And that means, in principle, there's enough energy in one glucose molecule to make 92 ATPs. Now, as you can see here, I don't have 51 pound coins here, so that would be a, a pretty poor exchange rate if somebody gave me that number of pound coins for a 50 pound note. And it's rather like that in respiration. Although, if you look at the energetics, in theory, you should get 92 uh, ATPs, or be able to get 92 ATPs from one glucose. Um, if the cell gets only, in practice, about 32. Now, when, when I show you the the reactions of respiration, how this is brought about, you'll see that it's set up to give a maximum theoretical amount of 36, but in practice you get about 32. So it's about 35% efficient, which again doesn't sound much, but if you compare that with the machines that we make, such as a car engine, which is a, a machine for getting the energy out of fuels such as petrol into a useful form, they are much less efficient. I'm not an engineer, but I think it's somewhere around about 20%. Right, let's have a look then. Um, why is it then that um, a molecule of, gluc of, of ATP releases 5.1 times 10 to the minus 23 kilojoules? It's much less than a glucose molecule. One of the reasons is that when you break down glucose in respiration, you're breaking it down completely to get the energy out. You get every almost all of the energy available from this molecule is coming out because all the carbons are being oxidized to CO2 and all the hydrogens are being oxidized to H2O. That's like a complete combustion reaction. With the ATP, the cell is not combusting the ATP. It's not breaking it down completely when it gets some energy out of it. It's only taking some of the energy, the chemical energy stored in this molecule, it's taking the energy that's available when you break off this end phosphate group, phosphoryl group. So all that happens in a single reaction step is the end phosphate group is released from the ATP. Now the phosphate group then is represented by a PI and we're left with ADP, adenosine diphosphate. Now that's a single chemical reaction and that's all that's done to the ATP um, in most of the reactions in which energy is released from it. There are some other reactions I will tell you about. And similarly, when ADP is sent back to ATP using the energy from glucose in respiration, all that's happening is this energy from respiration is simply reattaching a phosphate group onto the ADP to make ATP. So you're not making ATP from scratch, as it were. You're not making it from its elements. All you're doing is reversing this. So if in this direction we release um, 30.5 kilojoules per mole, going back that way, we put that energy in it, and that's what's taken from the respiration reactions. Now you often hear about these um, chemical bonds between the phosphate groups as being high energy bonds, which is why you see them sometimes written as squiggles. But that's not really accurate. There isn't really any such thing as a high energy bond. They are unstable, chemically unstable in the sense that they can be broken easily. These have um, negative charges on them that are repelling each other, so sort of wanting to get apart from each other. But when you, when you break a phosphate group off ATP, you release this energy and it's not Normally, normally to break a chemical bond you put energy in, you're taught at GCSC and A-level chemistry that breaking chemical bonds requires energy. But that would be the bond enthalpy, the bond dissociation enthalpy, if you like, just physically breaking the bond. Here, you're not really breaking it in that sense, you're adding water across there. It's a hydrolysis reaction. So what happens is the H2O molecule gets added across the two phosphates incorporated into the product. So it's really a hydrolysis reaction, not a bond-breaking reaction.
or breaking with water, that's what hydrolysis means. And um, that's how we um, get the energy out of ATP. And when the ADP is recycled using the energy from glucose, a uh, water molecule is removed from here, so it's a condensation reaction going in the reverse direction. Now this is very good for the cell because when the cell needs a source of energy, if you think about muscle contraction or in, in transport systems, transporting ions across uh, biological membranes, you don't want to have to go through lots of chemical steps to get the energy out of glucose. You, you need to get it out very um, simply in a simple single chemical reaction. Uh, Secondly, that the ATP, because of this uh, bond, is, is unstable. It's, it's not stored. It doesn't last very long in the cell. So it gets turned over very quickly. So each ATP molecule in the body will get turned over at least five times a day. So there's a lot more ATP used than what there is sitting there in the body. It's a very nice uh, system for um, recycling the molecules, being fueled by the energy from glucose. Now you often see the reaction for the hydrolysis of ATP written something like this. Um, here is the ATP with its three uh, phosphate groups and I've represented the adenine base just as an AD. And so the hydrolysis gives us ADP and inorganic phosphate and it gives us 30.5 kilojoules per mole of ATP. Now that, um, that amount of energy is the energy released when you hydrolyze the terminal phosphate bond. So you're breaking the bond or hydrolyzing the bond between these two phosphates. You can get the same amount of energy if you um, then hydrolyze the bond between the next uh, phosphate and, and the molecule. So this time I would get a molecule of AMP, which is adenosine monophosphate, which is here plus a second inorganic phosphate. So this one, AMP, is adenosine monophosphate. I would need some water to hydrolyze it, and I would get another 30.5 um, kilojoules of energy per mole of these hydrolyzed. Now sometimes it can be a little bit uh, confusing in the textbooks because you see a different value for this second bond and that corresponds to when you break that second bond directly. So if I hydrolyze the second bond but not the first then I'm releasing these two phosphate groups which are represented like that. That's just the two phosphates still attached. It's called a pyrophosphate group and I make um, AMP in this reaction as well, as over here. So that's AMP. But when you carry out that reaction, then the energy released is 45.6. So plus 45.6 kilojoules per mole of energy released. So that's the distinction um, between breaking this bond and then this bond as opposed to breaking this bond directly. Now in most of the um, chemical reactions in the cell where ATP is used as a source of energy you only break this one and in fact in respiration uh, ATP is made from ADP directly from ADP. I should say that you can also break this bond, this is the phosphoester bond, and it releases um, about 17 kilojoules per mole. Sometimes you see that represented again. Now it's very unusual in the cell for ATP hydrolysis to occur with the um, direct release of the free inorganic phosphate. That would release the energy in the form of heat. Um, what often happens is that the phosphate group is transferred onto another molecule. And a very good example is the very first reaction in respiration, um, starting with glucose. So if we take a glucose molecule, which I, I can just represent it like that, the very first thing that happens to it in respiration is it gets a phosphate group added. So I can write that 
something like that. So it's using an ATP molecule and a glucose molecule to give an ADP and a glucose glucose six phosphate. And what the reason this happens is that um, for glucose to participate in the reactions of respiration, it has to be made more reactive. It has to be activated. Just glucose sitting there will not break down and release its energy in, in respiration. So first of all, we have to take the energy that's stored in ATP by virtue of these phosphates and transfer some of that energy onto the glucose. So now the glucose is much more reactive. So it's glucose with a phosphate on and then it can take part in the subsequent reactions. So it's a little bit like um, when you turn on a Bunsen burner in the lab. You want the methane gas to react with oxygen, but to get it to do that, you've got to make it a, you've got to give it a bit more energy by putting a match there to ignite it. So what you're really doing is um, providing the uh, energy for the activation energy to make the methane molecules collide more violently with the oxygen molecules in the air to get a chemical reaction to happen. Now in cells you can't do that, you can't put a match under a cell or use a Bunsen burner. Uh, so the strategy is a very common strategy when you want to get a molecule to be more reactive to get going in a chemical reaction, you transfer a phosphate group onto it from um, ATP. So when I said earlier that um, the um, theoretical amount of uh, ATP or number of ATP molecules you can get from a molecule of glucose by respiration, I said that that's 36. That's allowing for the fact that some of the ATP is actually used at the beginning. So in fact the next step is the addition of a second phosphate onto the glucose. So in um, respiration, at the very very beginning you're investing two ATP molecules but then you get 38 back so the net that you get in theory is 36 but in practice you only get 32 because the later reactions um, they're not that efficient. So it's a little bit like again in, in the lab with a Bunsen burner. The reason you light a Bunsen burner is to get some heat energy but to do that you have to put in a little bit of heat energy in the form of a match but then you get that back plus more once you've lit the Bunsen burner and the reaction's underway. So you get the ATP back that you invest at the beginning much more once you've got the glucose running through the reactions of respiration. Here I have represented the overall process of respiration in the form of an energy level diagram of the type that you would use in chemistry. So on the y-axis I've got the energy, so the higher something that is at the page, the more energy it contains relative to something lower down the page. So we start off with um, glucose and six oxygens at this energy level, this height if you like on the page, and we finish up down here lower energy with the six carbon dioxides and the six waters. Now, we could just release all of this energy in one go. We could do that by burning the glucose. So that would be the process of combustion. But of course, that's not very helpful to the cell. So in respiration, we still go from this energy level to this energy level, but in lots of little steps. And each of these steps is brought about by its own enzyme or series of enzymes and this allows the cell to regulate the process, keep it under tight control and um, the energy then is released in small amounts rather than in one big go. So it's rather like um, having a ping pong ball that you place at the top of your stairs on the landing and if you were just to kick it off the landing and let it fall down to the ground floor in one go, it would release its energy. It's got energy, uh, it's got gravitational potential energy because of its uh, position, its height, and uh, if you do just kick it off the landing and let it go down to the ground floor, then the energy is being released in the form of kinetic energy and eventually dissipated as uh, sound and heat energy. The difference is with respiration is that the ping pong ball would be allowed to bounce down the staircase in lots of little steps. It would still end up at the same energy level down at the bottom. And so this is respiration, that's the difference. And of course what happens is that when the ping pong ball bounces down the stairs in respiration, 
some of the energy is captured or harnessed or converted into ATP. So you get lots of opportunities to make ATP. Of course, when I explain the mechanism of respiration in a separate tutorial, I'll show you how this happens in, in, in detail. But overall, we get a maximum, theoretical maximum, of 36 ATPs from each molecule of glucose by respiration. Okay, so that's, that's the, a, a useful analogy. It's also rather like um, a waterfall. If you just let water tip off a waterfall, then the gravitational potential energy of the water at the top is uh, converted to kinetic energy as the water falls down, which is eventually dissipated as, as, as sound energy and as heat energy. But what you could do is send it down um, through a series of turbines, which uh, could then use the energy to do something useful. They could um, turn uh, turbines and generate electricity. So that's really what's happening in, in respiration. You're, you're putting that um, energy to use. Now, if this was all that ever happened to glucose, uh, then very quickly all of the glucose on the planet would run out and so we need a mechanism for regenerating the glucose from carbon dioxide and water and that of course is the process of photosynthesis which is here, photosynthesis. And if you release this much energy when glucose is oxidized to carbon dioxide and water, then to send the carbon dioxide and water back up to this level, so it's like you're sending water back up the waterfall, or you're putting the ping, sending the ping pong ball back up the stairs, you've got to put energy in, and of course this energy comes from, from, the, uh, from the sun, it's light energy. So in the um, next tutorial, I'm going to explain to you the big picture here about the relationship between photosynthesis and respiration, how they all fit together to form one big coherent energy cycle before then looking at these processes in detail.